No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you'll always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great program today, and we're focusing on the big picture of Scripture. We'll begin with our devotional time, which consists of our Scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of our Scripture. Today, we'll be looking at Luke 4, 16 through 21, a passage where Jesus reads Scripture in the synagogue. Get out your Bibles, turn to Luke 4. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, we head to the workshop where Troy Spradlin is repairing our understanding about learning the Bible. And he gives us some practical advice to help it make sense. Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about the three bears, and they're not the three bears you heard about as a child. And we sit down with Freddie Clayton, and he's challenging us to look into the Scriptures instead of blindly believing what someone tells us. That's how we'll stay walking and talking in the light. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Well, I hope you have your Bibles open up to Luke 4, where we read beginning at verse 16. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Our passage here in Luke 4 comes from the beginning of Jesus' ministry. 
In chapter 3, he was his baptism where he kicked off his ministry. Chapter 4 begins with his 40 days in the wilderness and his temptation. Then he begins immediately teaching in Galilee, and he comes to Nazareth where our passage takes place. Here he was invited by the ruler of the synagogue to read and comment on Scripture. And he reads a passage from Isaiah 61 where the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. We saw that passage that happened in chapter 3 at his baptism when the Spirit of the Lord came on him like a dove, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit. We see this process of being anointed happens at his baptism. You see, priests, kings, and even some of the prophets were anointed at the beginning of their service. He was all three, a prophet, a priest, and a king. And we see that happen at the beginning of his ministry. He's beginning to preach and teach, and we start to see him performing miracles to confirm the things that he was saying. The passage also says that he was to bring liberty for the oppressed. That would be fulfilled at the cross when he took away the greatest oppression of mankind, and that would be sin. But in a sense, he was also giving liberty to those who had been led astray by the false teachers of that day by bringing the truth. And in addition, he was to proclaim the year. This great event that was prophesied in Scripture, he said, is happening right now. This is what Scripture has been leading up to ever since that sin in the Garden of Eden and God's first promise found there in Genesis 3, verse 15. Then Jesus sat down. That was a position that the teacher would take after he read Scripture. He would sit down and explain what it is that he had just read. He taught them as was the custom of the day, and he began his sermon with the statement, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. So we see Jesus grabbing their attention. We don't have all the details of everything that he said uh, in this passage. His sermon went on, but that was the beginning. So as we try to apply this, we need to understand that Scripture is there to point us to Christ. Back in the Old Testament, we have God's promises of Christ. We have His predictive prophecies that would be fulfilled. We see God working through His people to have a nation in which to send the Christ, His Son. And we also see God's attitude towards sin to help us understand why we need salvation. You see, this all revolves around Jesus, even though He hasn't even shown up yet. Then we get to the New Testament. And we have the gospel accounts, and they tell us the story of Jesus. Then the book of Acts, which gives us the history of the church that Jesus established through his teaching. And then after that, we have letters to Christians telling them how to live because of what Jesus did. You see, everything before and after points back to Jesus, he is the central figure in all of Scripture. We need to look at that big picture. Each of us, as we look at the Word of God, needs to ask what we need to do to be a part of His great plan, because that's the main point that Scripture has. And as we read through the book of Acts, we can see what people did in response to that message. Do what they did, become what they became. It all began with preaching. Individuals heard the message about Jesus and what He did, and they were convicted by their own sins, their own rebellion toward God. They believed what they were told and were ready to obey. They were willing to repent of their sins, and then they acknowledged their belief and were baptized in water for the remission of their sins. That's the big picture, and that is what can bring salvation to you today. And that's good news. It's time for us to head over to the workshop where Troy Spradlin is waiting for us. He's going to repair our understanding about the big picture of the Bible. Do you know almost anyone can understand the Bible? If they'll just put forth the effort to read and learn it. It's really not that complicated. But it can be challenging, and Peter says that in 2 Peter 3, verse 16. 
And perhaps the most challenging aspect of learning the Bible is trying to fit all the personalities and events together. This is usually what confuses people, and most of the time it's also why many believe they can't understand the Bible. And the reason for this is because not all of the Bible is written or arranged in chronological order. You see, in, in our modern society, we like to read historical documents with everything in an identifiable sequential order. And Scripture is just not organized in that way. The first part of the Old Testament is arranged in chronological historical order, but then after the book of Esther, the rest of the books are arranged by theme and by, by size. In the New Testament, the first five books are arranged in a historical order, but then the rest of the New Testament books are not placed in any chronological order. All of this presents a rather daunting challenge to many who are just trying to make sense of the Scriptures. Why don't we repair our understanding with a few key points and suggestions that maybe will help eliminate some of this confusion for you? Number one, always remember that the entire Bible is focused around just one subject, and that is redemption. It is the history of redemption, 1 Peter 1, 10 through 12. Everything that happened, every person that is mentioned, and every book, chapter, and verse is centered around God's plan to redeem man back to Him, Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 6. Number two, take note of the overall context of every book, chapter, and verse in light of its position or its place in Scripture, realizing that not everything is always in chronological order. Identify who is speaking to whom and who are they are speaking and what the overall situation is or the purpose for the writing. And number three, read the entire Bible as it is arranged and then reread the Bible in chronological order. There are chronological Bibles that can be purchased and reading plans that are available to assist you in that endeavor. And these are three suggestions that will help you a lot. But here's an analogy I like to use to help learn what the Bible is and how to learn the Bible better. Think of it as if you are assembling a jigsaw puzzle. You see, with the puzzle, you must have the overall picture in your mind or be able to reference it in order to determine where each piece of the puzzle is supposed to fit. It's the same with Scripture. With the big picture in mind, that being redemption history, we can more easily identify each part as having its specific place. With the puzzle, the more pieces you connect together, the clearer the section becomes and the main picture starts to come into focus. It's the same with the Bible. For example, if you know the book of Acts, then many of the letters written to the churches, which are mentioned in the book of Acts, make more sense in overall context. And the same in the Old Testament books like 1st and 2nd Samuel or 1st and 2nd Kings, each one provides more context for the other. And the more parts of the Bible you connect with other parts, the bigger and better view you have and acquire. And that's why Paul wrote, whatever things were written before were written for our learning, Romans 15, 4. So in the end, don't be afraid of the Bible and don't think you can't understand it. You certainly can. Just treat it like you would a jigsaw puzzle. Thanks, Troy. Here's those three points again. The entire theme of the Bible is man's redemption. As we've seen time and time again, context is critical to understanding what a passage means. And three, read chronologically to help understand some things a little bit better. Here at Good News Today, we're always wanting our audience to spend more time in the Bible, see things for themselves. You can do that by enrolling in our free Bible course. In just a minute, we'll give you our contact information. You can also email us with questions. We'd love to answer them. Then Jim Dearman's going to be with us after this brief break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free 
at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. Remember that you can always enroll in our Bible course right on our website. You can also listen to Good News Today on truth.fm at any time. There's a whole Good News Today channel. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about the three bears. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Once upon a time, there were three bears. Is that opening to the old fairy tale familiar to you? Did you know there is the story of the three bears in the Bible also? No, I'm not talking about Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. I'm talking about the three important principles taught in the New Testament. Bear one another's burdens, bear your own burdens, and bear the mark of Christ on your life. A faithful Christian will bear the burdens of others, those heavy burdens. He knows that loving his neighbor means helping anyone who needs him. A Christian also knows that he must be strong enough to bear his own burdens, that is, his own responsibilities, before he can be strong enough to help anyone else. And the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6, 17 said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Bearing our own burdens in the sense of responsibilities and the heavy burdens of others may not always be easy. But marks left by doing the will of Christ are battle scars from a heavenly campaign. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Thanks for those thoughts, Jim. May we all be found bearing those battle scars. There's a lot of material you can access from our apps. They're available for Android, Apple, and Roku, and they're all free in the App Store. Now, Freddie Clayton is going to challenge us to see what the Bible says rather than just accepting what somebody tells us as he comes to us walking and talking in the light. Many, if not most people, take for granted certain things and believe them just because that is what they've always been told. It could very well be that you find yourself in that situation now, believing and doing things because that is what you were told. Religious people sometimes believe and practice things only because a preacher said it or because that is what their parents have always taught them. Regardless of what one believes or practices, it's a shame that when you believe something, you believe on it because of what somebody else says instead of examining it for you say. We want to challenge you thinking here. We want to challenge the way you think here. We want to create within you a, a desire to know God's will that can only be found in the Scripture. With this in mind, you may be surprised to learn that miracles and spiritual gifts work through men have ceased. Many claim the ability to work miracles and speak in tongues today. However, their claims fall far short of what the Bible actually teaches. The scriptures teach that miracles were done for the purpose of proving who Christ was, and for confirming the word that was spoken. Listen to John's affirmation in John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. These things are written so that you might Believe, we have the inspired record. Consider as well, Mark chapter 16 at verse 20. And they went out and preached everywhere and confirming the word through the accompanying sign. For example, when the apostles were about to preach the gospel, they needed some way to prove that what they said came from God. Thus, God worked with them, confirming the word through accompanying signs. Yet the Bible also teaches that the time would come when those spiritual gifts would cease. I suggest you read clearly 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. They were to cease when revelation was completed, when all truth promised by Jesus was revealed, 
then there would be no more need for the accompanying sign. The word was confirmed, and we have the result today in the Bible. If you've been taught otherwise, search the scriptures to see what they say about miracles and spiritual gifts. You may be surprised at what you learn. This is Freddie Clayton, walking and talking in the light. Thanks, Freddie. We need to know what the Bible really says and not just believe whatever someone tells you that it says. The way to do that is with regular personal Bible study, and we offer the Good News Today podcast to help you do that. Good News Today daily devotional time. Wherever you get your podcast, find it, and you can start every day with your daily dose of good news. Now, Chad Dullahite joins us for just a minute. May I have just a minute of your time? People sometimes have questions about the Bible or perhaps want to study some particular subject further. Maybe it's not been addressed here on Just a Minute, or maybe it's something that it's just impossible to give a 60-second answer. If I can help anyone anywhere in studying God's Word and understanding it better and especially obeying it, I'm glad to do so. Maybe you want to talk by phone. Maybe you'd like a Bible study course to do through the mail, or maybe you'd rather watch an online video or have a DVD. Still others prefer a tract on a particular topic. Whatever you prefer, contact me and I can assure you I will find material that will help you to study the Bible. How much is this going to cost me, Chad? As with everything we offer here, not one cent. The gospel is God's power to salvation, Romans 1.16. And as Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give, Matthew 10, 8. Just contact me, and I'm happy to send you whatever I can to help you out. I'm Chad Dollahide from the Bremen Church of Christ, and this is Just a Minute. That's a great offer, and one I recommend you take advantage of. Thanks, Chad. In just a moment, we'll give our Bible question to Guyton and Troy. Now we have a Bible question for Guyton and Troy. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Hey, Troy. Yes, sir. Has anybody ever accused you of being hard-hearted? <laughs> well, I won't get into the details of that, but uh, yes, I unfortunately have been called that a time or two. Now, sometimes that happens. Uh, normally, it's misunderstanding. Yeah, it usually is. Or it's just selfishness on the, on, like in that case, on my part or something that I just need to... Need to understand what's going on. I got you. Well, the question today, yeah, somebody wrote in and said, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Oh, well, I was wondering where you're going with this. And that's, that, you know, it's a common question. I've heard this question many times. All right, lay the context. Now, I'm not going to read all of it. But you go to the Old Testament. The Israelites are in Egyptian bondage. Mm -hmm. God has already spoken to Pharaoh, uh, Moses. Go to Pharaoh. Tell him, let my people go. Mm -hmm. He goes and... Of course, Pharaoh says no, because he's going to lose the labor. And um, so we have the plagues that come along. Mm -hmm. And so you have 10 plagues. And after a plague, it would say, well, you know, almost maybe like Pharaoh's going to let him go. But it says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. He even says, I will harden his heart. Exactly. And uh, some people say, you know, why did he do this? Well, uh, I think in answering this, we also need to talk about how God hardens our heart or right. how God maybe even opens hearts. There you go. That's a great point because whenever you think about the heart, you know, what is it that's reaching the heart? Did God physically reach in and, and touch that heart or supernaturally touch that heart? Well, if you pay attention to context and you pay attention to what you see all through the teaching of the scriptures, you come to passages like, for example, in Acts chapter 
uh, 16, verse 14, it talks about Lydia and how the Lord opened her heart. Well, again, the, the question you were posing, how did that happen? Well, I believe it's through the Word. I think we see that in whenever Jesus says that he's going to send the Spirit, and it's the Spirit that's going to convict the world of sin, and that's the one that gave us the inspired Word. And so how does God convict the heart? How does God reach in and touch the heart? I believe it's through the Word. It is, and sometimes it can even be a totality of circumstances that's going on. Mm. Because we know God doesn't affect the free will of man, but he can allow for an influence. And so if it's um, other than a person, he can direct his creation Uh to help influence. Now, some people say, well, why did he do this? you got to go back to what the plagues were. Remember the first um, part, first several plagues, um, it wasn't just the Egyptians that suffered. It was That's the Israelites, right. too. That's right. And every single plague was actually an attack against an Egyptian god. Now, fast forward real quick. Remember the problem they had in the wilderness was that they wanted to keep returning mm-hmm. to those uh, Egyptian gods, the mm-hmm. golden calf that they would fashion. Where did they get that from? From Egypt. And so every time Pharaoh's heart was hardened, it allowed another plague which every plague was being sent with a a message of, I am the true God. Mm -hmm. I am the one that's in control. The Israelites were were reminded of that. Mm -hmm. The Egyptians, they saw it. And let's also notice by the time you get to the 10 plagues, remember uh, they were ready for them to leave, (laughs) even to the point that they borrowed, they asked for gold and silver. And what does it say that the Egyptians? They willfully gave it, gladly gave it to them. (laughs) And so God was preparing his people as well as the Egyptians for the departure and the fulfillment of a prophecy that those Israelites would go to the land of Canaan. And so why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? To bring about his will, the fulfillment of prophecy, so that we can one day read the glorious New Testament about Jesus coming in this world to bless all families of the earth. Amen. God always brings about His purpose, and we see that throughout Scripture. Well, I hope that we've helped you to better see the big picture of Scripture. We always encourage you to check every religious teaching against the Word of God to see if it's true, Acts 17, 11. Remember, you can watch or listen to our program again if maybe you didn't hear something right and have a question. Have some extra time? Check the Scriptures to make sure that we're telling you the truth. You can hear our podcast again or listen to it on our website or through one of our apps. And if you have any questions, contact us. We'd love to hear from you. Remember that we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. Good news, good news, there is good news today.